Hey everyone, I am Fallon Mercedes Brock, your host. I'm a health reporter, nutritionist, trainer, and herbalist. And today on the Fit with Fallon podcast, I have a very special guest, Dr. Price. He is a pharmacist, drug dealer, should I say, or was to an herbalist healer. I know that sounds kind of confusing, but Dr. Price, you'll explain more to us. How are you? I'm doing fantastically well. Thanks for having me on. So what made you go from being a pharmacist and actually you called yourself in your new book, The Vegetation Over Medication, uh, you felt like a drug dealer. You were like, I was a drug dealer and now you're an holistic healer. So yeah. why did you feel like a drug dealer? Well, I, I honestly didn't feel that way at first. I mean, at first I really thought I was helping people. I mean, I was, when I came out of school, I was doing things like brown bags at churches, going to shelter, homeless shelters, helping people with their health there, so volunteering. Um, so I really felt like I was doing a lot of good. Even when I was working in the hospital as a clinical pharmacist, you know, I would see like people of color and they'd see me and they'd get excited to see somebody in a white coat. And they would always be very candid with me about what's going on in their health. So. I really felt like I was doing like a lot of good, like teaching people about their medicines and also teaching people like, hey, you need to eat better. Um, but I guess where I started to feel like a drug dealer was when my health started to go bad and I switched my diet up because I had gained a lot of weight. I was working 12, 14 hour shifts at the hospital and um, it just weighed on me a lot. So I started eating too much, not exercising enough you know, the usual stretch you get in, um, you know, the daily American life. And uh, I bloomed up to about 245 pounds, almost 250. Oh, wow. And so my normal weight had been around about 200. So I literally gained about 50 pounds, but it didn't look horrible on me because I'm, I'm sort of tall. Yeah. So it just looked like I was a football player. <laughs> so nobody really called <laughs> me out on it. Yeah, nobody really called me out on it. Uh -huh. and, but you know, the unfortunate thing, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And even in high school, like I was an athlete, only had about 5% body fat. So I was super fit, mm -hmm. but I wasn't healthy. Uh, and so I chalked it up to heredity. And so I lived with it for over a decade. And then at some point, I just started to feel like my health was starting to deteriorate. I had gained all this weight. I was barely 30. Mm -hmm. I had high blood pressure energy was through the floor. It was just so many things that were just cueing me like, you're not supposed to feel this way at 30. Yeah. And uh, so I started trying every diet I could. I mean, every diet you can imagine, I tried it and it mm -hmm. didn't work. And uh, I would lose a little bit of weight and then it would come right back. And in most cases, it would come back with a vengeance. Like I lose five pounds and a couple months later, I gained 10 back. Now, how does that feel? Well, how did you feel as you know, somebody who went to pharmacy school, you know every drug out there, and yet you can't find a diet where you can keep the weight off. Well, unfortunately, most most healthcare professionals have this struggle, mm -hmm. and so I mean, I was talking to colleagues like, "Hey, what are you doing?" And, but then I started to realize like all of us were having the same issue. Mm -hmm. And nobody really knew what to do about it. And everybody had a trainer. Everybody had a, a meal plan they had bought. And none of it was working. And so from my perspective, I just realized, I, like, we weren't taught this. Mm -hmm. This weren't, wasn't something that whether you're a physician, pharmacist, or a nurse, like, we weren't taught this. Mm -hmm. And even when we were consult with the nutritionist, like, that wouldn't work either. And so from my perspective, I just felt like, what, there's something about the human body that we don't get. And I needed to figure out what that was. And so I just figured, since I didn't know what it was, I just try everything. And if something worked, we start there. So who introduced you to the vegan diet? Because I'm pretty sure, you know, I think it's very popular, the keto diet or many others. But yeah. what made you want to try plant-based? To, to be honest, I when, when I initially started, decided to go plant-based vegan, I had, any, I had never heard of the term vegan. Mm -hmm. So um, really I, was, I used to listen to the, all these motivational tapes, like 
you know, everything from Joseph Murphy to, you know, Tony Robbins. And I was listening to one with Tony Robbins and he used to do these retreats where on the retreat, you would do nothing but drink green smoothies and eat plant-based foods. And all these people talked about all of this energy that they would have throughout the weekend. And when they left, they would just sustain it. And so I figured, well, Tony always says it takes 21 days to create a new habit. So I said, I'll do it for 21 days. There's no way I'm going to do this for a lifetime, but I'll do it for 21 days if it can lose me five or 10 pounds and, Mm -hmm. you know, I get some energy back. And so in 21 days, I think I lost about 17 pounds. Wow. And so seeing that, I, I mean, I had literally paid for all kind of stuff, including trainers, none of that kind of stuff worked. And um, I eat plants for 17, I mean, 21 days and I lose 17 pounds. And now I'm like, okay, this might have a little bit of magic to it. So I decided to do 60 days. And in 60 days, I lost 45 pounds. Wow. And the most noticeable thing that happened was my high blood pressure was no longer high anymore. It was normal. And it wasn't just normal. It was really good. Like when I got my blood pressure checked, the doctor he had to check it like three times just to make sure. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the point that I started to sort sort of looking, look at the healthcare system that I was in and all the education that I learned and started to think, well, maybe this is not it. And maybe food really is medicine. And because I look a hell of a lot different, you know, now I got a visible neckline, my skin looks (laughs) different. I look younger. Mm-hmm. All of the patients who were very familiar with me were coming into the hospital, seeing me and saying, what the hell happened to you? Now, did, did they think you were sick? Because I find it interesting when people see you lose a lot of weight in a short amount of time, sometimes they'll ask you like, are you okay? Are you sick? And I'm like, no, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sick. Yeah. My, actually, my family thought I was sick. Yeah, yeah. My family, my my patients, not so much so, but my family definitely thought I was sick. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because we do have um, some obesity in my family. Mm -hmm. And because I lost the weight so quickly. Mm -hmm. And typically when you lose weight that quickly is because you are sick. So, you know, I did have some family members who like voiced a lot of concern about, hey, are you okay? Um, but the patients at the pharmacy were, I mean, a couple of them were like, man, you look like you got the Benjamin Buttons disease. Like you're reversing, <laughs> your age is re- reversing. And so, you know, after kind of telling them what I was doing, that was the point that I started to feel like a hypocrite. Mm-hmm. Because as I'm like giving people essentially a plant-based prescription, I'm also handing out these prescriptions that, you know, I was prescribed. And I witnessed myself reversing those conditions within myself. And so that's when I started to feel like the hypocrite or drug dealer in the pharmacy. So at what point did you realize, like, I can't do this anymore? You know, like, I have to make a change. Like, what brought you to that point? And was it a difficult decision for you? Or was it like... Oh, this is easy. Because being a pharmacist, you go to school for a very long time. You're a doctor. And I'm sure you spent a lot of money for your education. So how was it to walk away from that? And what was the catalyst that made you walk away? You know, the the funny thing is, is that I just, in in the initial phases, I believe that I could do both. Mm -hmm. And, And it's quite possible I could have, because the truth is, is that unfortunately, no matter how much information I give people and how many cases I can show people like, hey, that disease state you have, you don't have to live with it. Mm -hmm. People are still going to do what they're going to do, which means that they're going to be on medication. Mm -hmm. And so in the real world of thinking, the unfortunate side is that I'm going to meet people who are on medications who want to make the transition. So I have to know both sides. Yeah. And so initially, I thought I could do both. But again, like, I think what started to weigh on me was my conscience in terms of, like, as I began to learn more and more and more, 
has started to weigh on me more and more and more. And also, in addition, the more people I told or gave the plant-based prescription to and told them what herbs to use, and they would come back 30, 60 days later, they were reporting the same things. Yeah. And more and more people were telling me, oh, it helped my diabetes too. Oh, it helped my autoimmune condition too. And so it just started to show me like, oh, this can actually help everything. Yeah. It kind of sounds like, you know, when you find your faith, you know, sometimes when you, you find a connection with God or whoever you believe in, you want to spread that truth out. You want to tell everybody what it changed you, what it did to you. And and you just, you feel so passionate about it that you want to help other people. So it kind of sounds like similar to that. Yeah, I think what happens is, is that I think, in a sense, we're all searching for a purpose. Mm-hmm. And I believe our purpose is how we want to serve the world, God, and this whole collective. Mm-hmm. And I think once we figure out what that is, like what that purpose is and wh- how we're going to serve this greater collective, mm-hmm. once you figure that out, it's hard to walk away from that. And... I always tell people that's the difference between having a job and finding your work in life. Your job, it can fire you. You can quit. Mm -hmm. You got to interview for it. Your work in life is not something you interview for. It's something you can't be fired from. And so that's what I discovered in this. Yeah, this is my work. Mm -hmm. Like this is, I may not make six figures ever again. But I will definitely be always be full, you know, helping people reclaim their health, helping people rediscover themselves. Because I really feel like when you get your health back, that is when you can really start the journey to really discovering your highest version of yourself. And so, um, you know, after a couple of months, uh, after that discovery, I just decided to leave. I left and I just decided I was going to take a couple of months off and then I'd go from there. And so ended up leaving the job at that point. Now in your book, you talk about, to me, it sounded like an eat, pray, love journey. You kind of traveled all over the world. You went to Japan um, and studied with, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Okinawans. The... <laughs> yeah, Okinawan centenarians. Yeah. And, and they're kind of like the oldest population um, in the world because they're so healthy. They live for so long. And then you went to India and studied yeah. like yoga and meditation. And then you went a couple other places too. So yeah. did you purposely seek out those places or was it something that just naturally aligned and then kind of brought you on your journey to where you are now? You know, the funny thing was like, after I quit my job, it seemed like everything started to align. Instead of me like trying to force things, like I felt like getting into pharmacy school was like, It was easy for me, but initially I was trying to get into medical school and that was so tough. Got in, but decided to go to pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. Pharmacy school was so hard. All right, so I finally get out of that. And then I get into the hospital and working for the FDA and that's so hard, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. And then finally I leave that job and everything after that was just easy. It just, it it, it didn't feel like I was working. It felt like I was waking up having the opportunity to go play every morning. Mm -hmm. And so every opportunity, so when I moved to Japan, that was an email that came out of nowhere and they asked me if I was interested in the opportunity. I thought it was spam mail, so I deleted it like (laughs) at least four times. And then I finally responded to it, saw it was real and talked to the people. And in a split, split second, I just made a decision, I'm going. But I literally, from April until, like, July, like, did everything I could not to take the position. I mean, I didn't respond to their emails. They would say things like, hey, what is it going to take to get you to come? And I'm like, pay me this, and then I'll come. And I just made some astronomical number. They're like, okay, when can you come? And so, like, everything just seemed so easy. So when I moved to Japan, and I lived there for about four years, and I figured, figured like I learned everything I could here Mm -hmm. 
I really, at that point, everybody was looking at me like I was crazy anyway, because I mean, I had this very promising career I had received awards for. And, um, you know, I threw it all away and moved to Japan. Like, who does that? Mm -hmm. And so everybody was looking at me like I was crazy anyway. Here's this kid from the hood. He finally becomes a doctor and he just throws it all away. Like, everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. And so, like, when I left Japan, I was in no hurry to come back here and, you know, like, to people who thought I was crazy. So in my mind, I was like, let's learn more. I was like, they can't be the only people who can teach me. So I did go to Bali and spent some time there. I went to Thailand. Um, Bali, Bali is very famous for a lot of the Balinese heal healers. So that's why I went there. Oh. Um, Thailand is very famous for using herbs in their food. So that's why I went there and Vipassana meditation. Went to India for yoga and Ayurvedic medicine, also meditation. And then... Um, Africa is also known for herbs. So several countries in Africa, then Peru, then Honduras, and then back here where I wrote the book. So I really didn't plan any of those trips out. It was just, all right, I'm going to go here because, you know, like, I don't have a next move. My next move is learn more. That's and, amazing. you know, each time I would learn something and I would get to a point where I felt comfortable, it was just time to go and move on somewhere else and learn more. Yeah, that's amazing. It sounds like you definitely had like a higher um, calling that was moving you around to each place and you were able to bring back your book to share it with all of us. And um, yeah, that's amazing. Please tell me one thing that you learned from each place because I am fascinated with learning other cultures and, you know, here in America, we are so quick to eat fast food and when we become unhealthy we'll just take a pill so i know in other countries they are more holistic more natural they're more active for instance um, my father we're from the dominican republic and my great grandmother she just passed away but she lived to 104 years old and it's because she lived in the campo which was it's the country she didn't have a running toilet she didn't have yeah. a stove in her house it was a cement stove outside you know even in her 90s she was still cooking rice and beans and and eating cantaloupe and it's just right <laughs> yeah they, they are so much more active natural and less stressed so right. what did you learn from each place if you had to pick one thing well, I learned so much, but I, I think in Japan, what I really learned was the importance of everything in your lifestyle being holistic, not just your food, but in their community, each person was assigned another person. So a person who was 80 was assigned a person who was 100. A person who was 90 was assigned a person who was 105. They had these connections in their community with, I'm responsible for you. So when I wake up in the morning, I come and check on you. Oh, and that community was so important. So I learned a lot about making sure every aspect of your life is holistic. Because a lot of people will just center and focus in on the food and forget about all of the other areas. And so that's really where I learned a lot about in Japan. They lived a very slow lifestyle, an island lifestyle in Okinawa that wasn't based on anything but living a good life and so i mean i learned a lot of different principles which i talk about in the book in there but that's one of the main things i learned there and um in thailand i learned i did this so at the the monasteries the monks had this opportunity where you could do something called vipassana meditation which is basically silent meditation sport so for like 10 days 20 days you're not saying anything. You can't say a word. You can't read a book. You can't use your phone. Oh my goodness. You're just sitting with yourself. <laughs> How long and did you do? I did 15 days. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, um, you know, like when you're in that silence, you have a lot of inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I learned a, a lot about my inner voice. And so I teach people in my tribe membership a lot about that inner voice because Sometimes the inner voice isn't your, the voice that you want to be there. It's the voice that is telling you you're not good enough, that you 
can have these things that are harmful for you. Like, and so I always had, I always even remind myself of that when I'm in a space where I'm really busy, I check in on myself with my inner voice. So I learned that a lot in, um, in Thailand. In India, I learned a lot about yoga. I spent about six months in India um, studying Ashtanga yoga. And it's a very beautiful practice. And being able to stay in a place where you bathe out of a bucket and all you're doing is waking up at 5 a.m. every morning to go do um, yoga, meditation, chanting, so forth and so forth. It was just a beautiful process to get into that routine and get my body like prepared for what I was gonna go through in the rest of the traveling, but also like being able to download things from you know a higher place. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I could keep going, but That's every place amazing. I went, I learned a lot. I mean, I learned a lot about herbs in Africa. And, and what would you say, I know you sell herbs, detoxes, sea moss, and it's part of your group. What would you say is, your favorite herb that you got from another place or that you offer um, as one of your supplements on your website? Uh, my, my favorite herb is a herb prop. I don't, I don't sell only personally use, uh, which is slippery, um, slippery, slippery elm. elm. Mm -hmm. Slippery elm is one of them. And then also stinging nettle. Okay. And what um, do you so use those for? Well, stinging nettle is a herb that grows in the ground. It can grow up to 10 feet into the soil. And so whenever a plant grows that deep into the soil, it means that it's going to get a lot of nutrients. So it has a lot of nutrients. Mm. Um, in addition, so like I usually use that basically as a nutrifier in my body. Um, so um, that's stinging nettle. That um, makes sense because um, have you heard of grounding? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I recently saw a documentary and I guess grounding is where you go out in nature and you have to put your feet on the ground or, you know, people would say hippies hug a tree, but literally hugging a tree can help. And it's something the energy and the nutrients from the earth, I guess, can uh, heal inflammation in your body and, um, you know, if you have any pain or any illnesses, it's supposed to help ground you and heal you. So when you said yeah. the, the roots go deeper, that made me think of that. So it's probably uh, much more uh, beneficial for you the deeper the roots go. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, that's one of my favorite herbs as a herbalist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but uh, as you know, I have a detox. Uh, it's two different blends one has seven the other has eight herbs in it um they all work together it's like this beautiful symphony and that's why i always talk about balance um you know like for instance one is a tommy detox that's designed to uh, cleanse out your entire digestive system mm -hmm. from your tongue all the way to your anus and you know i have a herb in there for sage which clears out negative energy Mm -hmm. I have a herb in there, the slippery elm that I talked about before, and that's really good at actually calming down inflammation in the gut. Mm -hmm. I have a, another herb in there, uh, senna, which is good for cleaning out the gut. So, like, you have to put herbs together, which I learned this a lot in Africa. You have to put them in this synergistic way so that they're able to actually heal the body in a very holistic way, because that's the important thing. You don't want to force anything. You actually want to want your body to do the work and the herbs to actually just nudge it in the right direction. So yeah, it makes sense. Tell me more about your detoxes and your group. Um, I follow you online and I always hear you shouting out your tribe members and you talk about a private Facebook and I always see people commenting, I feel so much better. I lost so much weight. Uh, yeah. Tell us more about your, your group and if you have any like crazy healing stories that blew you away from any of your members. Yeah. Um, so the, the really great thing is I kind of keep the membership um, tight. So like the only time you really hear me talk about it is on my lives when my members are on my lives mm -hmm. and they're shouting me out or shouting, you know, tribe healing community out. Uh, and I keep it that way. I just don't promote it just so that, 
most of the people who come into the the membership are actually people who do my group detoxes. Mm -hmm. So what happens is every three to four months I do a group detox because all my my motto is is we have all these processes for cleaning our houses like spring cleaning. We have all these things we do for our cars, mm -hmm. detailing, oil changes, tune ups tire rotation, buying new tires, new brakes. We do all this stuff for our cars, but we have no process like that for our bodies. Mm -hmm. We just literally sit and wait for our bodies to deteriorate and rot, and then we try to respond reactively to healing ourselves. The whole idea behind a detox is basically for your body to be rebooted, to be rejuvenated, to be renourished, and that's what the group detox is for, because when you're in a group detox, you get a meal plan, you get recipes, you get the group of people who have been doing my group detox for the last three years. Mm -hmm. uh, you get me in there giving you education, sort of like what we're doing today. And we do that for 30 days. And at the end of the 30 days, I've seen people who had diabetes and high blood pressure who no longer have to take those medications. And it's not me being like this rebel, it's me me watching them work with their doctors and their doctors saying, I have to take you off this medication. I've seen women with issues like PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, recover from that. I've seen them have seven to 10 day periods. Uh, and then after the detox, the next month, their period reduced down to three or four days. Wow. Um, so we've seen like some really, really amazing thing. People, who had libido issues, don't have those issues anymore. Yeah. People who are unable to sleep are now able to sleep soundly. So it really just restores the body back to its factory set settings. And it has to do that because once you remove the acidity, the toxicity that comes from the food primarily, um, once you remove the mucus from the body and the inflammation from the body, the body can now relax. The, the body can go in a state of peace but it can't do that when it's innervated with all those things. And once it's clean, it can actually do that. That's amazing. I know I kind of discussed before we got on the interview, but I had read your book um, probably like six months ago and I wasn't ready to become vegan yet. And um, after I read it, I ended up coming into some health issues and um, I know a lot of it had to do with the food that I was eating. And I knew it from your book, from researching, and your book gave me the motivation to go vegan. So I've been vegan for three months now. And then my husband, he did it with me. He's been vegan for three months now. And this week he you know, went to the doctor and his doctor emailed him, so proud of him. He is no longer pre-diabetic. He cholesterol is lowered, his glucose is good, he lost weight. So I'm so excited. I go to the doctor in a couple of weeks <laughs> for my physical, so I'm excited. Right. But I, I feel so much better. When you were talking about energy, you could see me. I'm kind of all over right now. I have so much energy. Right. And I didn't even drink coffee today. You know, I don't, I don't <laughs> need to have that morning coffee. Um, I was struggling too with my weight and you know, you were saying women having PMS issues and I knew it was um, due to my hormones. They were unbalanced. And when you're constantly eating, you know, um, dairy, you know, and meat that have a bunch of hormones injected into them, you're yeah. adding that into your system. And, you know, I'm a trainer, I'm a nutritionist, and I couldn't keep the weight off. I did a TV show where I gained weight with the client on purpose and then I lost it. And I swear from that TV show on, I could never keep my weight off. I would go crazy, lose it, and then gain it back. And then go crazy, lose it, and then gain it back. Kind of like you, you, what you were saying in the beginning. And this is yeah. the first time where I don't have to kill myself working out two, three times a day, counting every calorie I eat. You know, right. I can... <laughs> I can eat carbs. I used to be so scared of carbs. And I, right. I coach a bunch of women. I train a bunch of women. And they're all so scared of carbs. And I keep telling them, like, you need to make the transformation. Like, you can enjoy, you know, healthy carbs, sweet potatoes. Right. And you can enjoy food and not have to worry about stepping on the scale the next day. And you feel so much better. 
I didn't know, um, and I know in your book too, you talk about how a lot of minorities, you know, they, they can't digest a lot of the dairy. They can't break it down. A lot of them are yeah. lactose intolerant. And, you know, I would always eat Greek yogurt because I'm thinking protein, protein. I got to get my protein in, you know, stay away from carbs, eat your protein. And um, the first week I went vegan, I no longer was bloated anymore. Like, yeah. I'm like, here I am. And then my menstrual cycles are so much better. Um, I could go on and on and on. But yeah, your yeah. book definitely, I wish it would have made me take the jump as soon as I read it. But I am so thankful that I had it in my back pocket. You know, yeah. like, I knew all the information. So when my doctor told me, hey, you know, you have a precursor for a cancer, you know, I automatically knew and the doctor wanted to test me to see if it was hereditary. And I knew, you know, yes, a certain percentage can be hereditary. And yes, we do have certain cancers in my family, but I knew it was the way I was eating, the way I was living. Right. So I was able to literally jump in and get the ball rolling and I feel so much better and I can't wait till I see the doctor again. So hopefully things will be better, but yeah, I appreciate, you know, the work that you're doing when you were saying, you know, when you have a calling that's pulling you, you know, you, you want to help people like you are helping so many people and my father too, he, um, yeah, it's just, it's all lining up. Like I went from me to my husband and then when I went home, my father, um, his PSA scores were elevated. Mm. And literally I was like, dad, you gotta go vegan. Like, and I sat him down and I made a spreadsheet of all the foods, um, especially like the cruciferous um, foods and vegetables. And I put which ones are good for, you know, prostate and, you know, cancer and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, he's been vegan for two months now and he lost, he had a big belly and his belly went down and um, yeah. he hasn't checked his levels yet. He said he wants to just try it a little longer. It's really a ripple effect. You know, you go to one person, that person goes yeah. to another person, that person. So you right. probably can't even count how many people you've, you've helped and healed. So thank you. That's my yeah, man. yeah, I appreciate it, man. It's it's definitely been a blessing, and you know, hearing the stories are just uh, it's the gratitude, like my gratitude for being used as a vessel. So, um, you know, thank you for you know making the movement spread because you know the the important thing to understand is like I can only do what I do from my standpoint. Mm -hmm. But when everybody else takes the information, uses it, gets healthy, and then shares it with the people they love, then it becomes like this, this movement that is, is just beautiful. Like to see people heal, to see people get better, to see people happier. It's a really beautiful thing. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and my father too, he, um, he owned businesses all his life. He owned a nightclub and then he had like stores little bodegas and so he would never be home he would never sleep he was always stressed out like for years and years he would never go to the doctor or take care of his health and you know after this situation um and he also had diabetes and now he's no longer on his metformin so beautiful <laughs> so after, <laughs> after all this you know he said to me wow if you don't have your health you don't have anything and i Nothing. think right now even with covid19 going on i feel like we're stuck at home you know we can't distract ourselves um i think it's forcing people to look in the mirror and yep. i know i watched you talk about covid19 and you were the first doctor that was speaking out on how to you know boost your immune system and and try to protect yourself through food through herbs why do you think a lot of doctors aren't talking about it do you think it's just they don't know they don't believe or they don't want you to know okay 
I honestly think they don't know. Like I was telling you, when I started my journey, I was having conversations with my colleagues. They don't know. <laughs> I, 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 and I know that's really hard to believe, but for the most part, most when you go to your doctor and you ask him nutritional information, he's giving you he's giving you his opinion, not his professional advice. Mm -hmm. So his opinion is he, almost equivalent with a layman's standpoint. Mm -hmm. So the unfortunate thing is they don't know. Like we don't, we're not taught how to use food as medicine. Yeah. And so even now I'm in the, the process of creating a course for doctors, physicians and- Beautiful. Um, yes, yeah, I, so, I, so I've that, interviewed so many doctors and they will tell me they might've had a couple weeks of nutrition you know yeah. the only i mean only about five percent of medical schools required yeah like one course yeah. so and you can't learn anything in one course yeah and so the unfortunate thing is that they really don't know there's not like this evil mm -hmm. person is saying no i don't want you to get healthy they don't know and the reason why i know they don't know is because you know the leading cause of death for cardiologists? Heart attacks. Heart attacks. Yep. They don't know. So I always try to tell people that and help them understand, like, they're, they're being kept just as ignorant as we're being kept as ignorant as the population. And so, you know, the thing is, is that right now our healthcare system is in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. It's is too far behind and um it's just like when cigarettes like at one point cigarettes were doctors were doing commercials saying hey i smoke camels in the 1950s it's crazy and they were telling they were saying things like benefits of smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. yeah i think now, i fast saw a commercial where um Pregnant women were smoking cigarettes yeah, from like yeah. the early 70s, yeah. 60s. I was like, what is going yes. on? So, you know, the unfortunate thing is that there's always a lag time behind on real factual truth. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is help people get ahead of the lag. You know how many people died between 1950 and then the 1980s when they finally started saying, hey, we need to put a warning box on the cigarettes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to Australia, they not only have a warning on it, they have a, like a disease heart. They have lung, a lung, a pair of smoked out lungs on the carton of the cigarettes. You can't just, I mean, it's pretty atrocious to buy a pack of cigarettes in Australia. Mm -hmm. So it just tells you that, you know, like we're just really behind when it comes on what really heals the body. Yeah, I've seen um, they're trying to petition um, dairy products, especially cheese, to put labels here in the United States that it could cause breast cancer. And, you know, the FDA, um, you know, they're, they don't want to do it, but a lot of people are fighting for it. A lot of doctors who are aware of how dairy can promote cancer. So it's right. going to be interesting to see, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, how our, you know, how when we walk into a supermarket, what it's going to look like and what the labels are, are going to be saying. You worked for the FDA um, and you mentioned that you've seen or heard about court cases of people you know, being harmed from medicine, and you talk about how our healthcare system is sick care system. What should somebody do who has to take certain medications? You know, who, for instance, my mother, um, she had a double lung transplant, so there's certain anti rejection medications she yeah. has to take. Or yeah. for me, what I'm going through, I'm on certain hormones that. The doctor is like, you have to be on these hormones until your precursor turns around. You know, do you say go against what they say and don't take those medications? Or do you feel like you can have a balance? Well, I, well, because of how the laws are set up, I could never say don't <laughs> do what your doctor says. <laughs> it's true. But what I, what I always tell people is that it's sort of like I talked about in the beginning. 
um, you know, like I realized me being me being a pharmacist was a was an advantage. Mm-hmm. Having the understanding of modern medicine and having the understanding of natural medicine is a great advantage when you come into contact with somebody who is on medications. You understand the impact of that medication on their body, both the side effects and also the biochemistry behind it. Mm-hmm. But you also understand what certain foods do and then also what certain herbs could do. Mm-hmm. And so in an ideal situation, what you want to do is use both until you don't have to use the modern medicine. Yeah. Um, you know, make your way, transition toward natural medicine as quickly and as healthy as possible. And so that's what I'm always sort of gauging people because I always tell people like, if I step off the curb and get hit by a bus, do not take me to an herbalist. Take me to the <laughs> exactly. emergency room. <laughs> Like, I'm not crazy. Yeah. But because modern medicine does a, a, an amazing job in the acute setting. So if I get hit by a bus or get cut or shot or things like that, modern medicine is perfect for. So in the short term, it's really great. But long term, like, it is not a good thing. And so I always tell people, make sure you're transitioning toward nature as, much, as quickly as possible. Yeah, my oncologist, the first meeting that I had with her, um, I asked her, okay, I know this is your plan. I'll do it. What should I be doing at home? Should I change my diet? I'm thinking of going vegan. I also read a lot about like um, IV infusions, like high doses of vitamin C. And her reaction was just like, you know, diet isn't going to do anything you know, you yeah. can eat, you can eat uh, whatever you want. <laughs> <It's> just like <laughs> clueless. I, I looked at her and clueless. I was just like, I can't believe. Like, I I understand you don't want to advocate for only one thing, but I'm, to sit there and say that I'm, I'm trying to tell you, you have to understand they literally have a layman's perspective yeah. on nutrition. And it's not because they're trying to be evil. It's because they don't know. Everything that we've been taught gave no indication that nutrition or herbs can make any major impact on any disease state. Mm -hmm. It's it's always looked at as as a supplement and not the foundation. And because of that, they're always going to say that will do nothing for you. Because they don't understand how healing works. Yeah. And I think this is important to take your health back into your own hands. And this is one reason why I wanted to start this podcast. I wanted to have these deep conversations with alternative type of healers and doctors. And, you know, so that way we can educate ourselves, me and my listeners through people like you, you know, so I, I, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions. I do have a couple more questions. Um, I know that when it comes to weight loss or just health in general, I've seen it with myself going vegan, you know, I was TMI, everybody watching or listening constantly constipated, had issues for years, was constantly having to take certain teas or, you know, supplements um, to try. Now that I'm vegan, I don't have those issues anymore. Just eating lots of plants and vegetables, fruits. So how many times a day is a person supposed to go to the bathroom and, you know, is going to the bathroom only a couple times a week, you know, yes, it will cause weight gain, but how does that impact your health overall? Does it have a negative connotation? Does it, does it hurt you in some way? Um, you should have a bowel movement every meal. Now, if you eat like a piece of fruit, you're not going to have a bowel movement, but if you have a full, for every full meal, you should have a bowel movement that day. Um, that's what I've seen with people who make the transition. That's what I've seen with people who are in my group detox. Mm-hmm. Some of them in the beginning even have, a, have more bowel movements than the meals they have during the day. Probably because they have um, so much backed up. Indeed. 
the average person has between 10 and 25 pounds of undigested food sitting in their gut. So fecal matter just sitting in the gut. So most people don't really have a belly. What they have is a, uh, an intestine or colon full of poop. Wow. Just sitting there breaking up. And so as a result, you know, it has become normal to be irregular and not have bowel movements because 70% of the population is constipated. Mm -hmm. You know, like most people are eating a huge amount of dairy. Most people are eating a huge amount of meat. And none of those things have fiber in them. None of those things have hydration in them. And that's what is required for a bowel movement. If you don't have fiber in your meals, if you don't have hydration in your meals, because you got to think about it, you can juice fruits and vegetables, right? And get mm -hmm. hydration out of it. You can't juice meat and dairy. There's no hydration <laughs> in it. There's no fiber in it. And if you buy things over the counter in a can, box, bag, those things have had the fiber ripped out of them. Yeah. So you're not eating fiber in that way too. So that's why the vast majority of people are irregular. It's not, it's only, it's common, not normal. And there's a difference between the two. People are looking at common, meaning like the vast majority of people today in America are actually either overweight or obese. That's mm -hmm. common, but that's not normal. Yeah. That's not how it was 50 years ago. Okay. Yeah. And it's the same thing too, when it comes to PMS, you know, I suffered from bad PMS and you know, I would talk to my doctor and she would say, that's normal. You know, it's being a woman. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think this is, this is normal. And then I would talk to my friends and they're like, oh yeah, I go through that too. And I'm like, yeah. but this shouldn't be this way. And then I started yeah. doing research and, um, there, like you were saying the PCOS or, um, PMDD it's called, or, you know, I had fibroids. I didn't even know I had fibroids. You yeah. know, I, I was like, who, who would have, no, I didn't know. And luckily what I did was my doctor, um, she said it was normal, but I knew something was wrong and I knew something was off. So I went to a website called let's get .com and I purchased an at home, um, hormone test. And once I got my results that my, um, my hormone levels, my estrogen was way estrogen high. Was, yep. It's called I, estrogen dominance. Yep. So that's what I had, estrogen dominance. And um, I called my doctor and I was like, I want to see a specialist. I know something's wrong. And then um, they told me, they checked me and that's when we found my fibroids. So, and then I had to get surgery, which I wish I would have went vegan then, but... <laughs> Yeah. And that and that's why in my book I call our healthcare system a sick care system. Is because in in today's healthcare sick uh system most things are normalized. They're they're normal. So when you go in there unless you are in a dire state they're going to say no that's normal. Mm -hmm. And it's not normal at all. In most cases, when you go in and the lab results that they choose to, to actually take that day come up normal, they're going to send you right home. Yeah. And there's people who go back and forth with the doctor because they know something is intuitively wrong in their body. But the doctor is like, well, the labs haven't said anything to me. Yeah. But the doctor hasn't asked them, how much water do you drink? How regular are your bowel movements? How much sleep are you getting? What's your energy levels like? Tell me about your period. Mm -hmm. Like they're not ask, asking these questions that really are like check engine lights to the body. And so as a result, you know, every illness is virtually normal. Even if you go in there with high blood pressure, they're like, oh, everybody got high blood pressure. I'm just give this five, 10 milligrams, you'll be fine. They don't give you any advice, real advice about what you can do to sort of get out of that pre-diabetic state or that low hypertension state and it's just because it, a they don't know and b because disease unfortunately has become normalized yeah i think it's important to seek out people in in your community you know who can assist you along the way and i want to talk more about your group um you have one coming up for the new year but you have to register register before then correct yes that's, that's correct so 
Yeah, I, I know the transition can be difficult for people. So that's why I created a group where inside of the group, there's a there's an online exclusive group that everybody's in. We typically have around about 300, 350 people in there every uh, new year. Um, but this year we're only able to do 200 because of uh, the pandemic and, you know, uh, unable to get um, the amount of supplies that we typically get. So, but in the group you get uh, a meal plan, you get recipes, you get coaching from me in a group setting twice a week. Uh, you get encouragement from who I call my group, my detox OGs because they probably do the detox every three, three to four months. Wow. Um, and then uh, you're just getting a host of other things. You're getting a 30 day herbal detox. It's just a, a huge benefit for people who need that type of support. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's something that you're not used to, especially if you're a person who's not plant-based, who's never did a detox before. It's just this uh, hand-holding process that you're able to go through with, you know, 200 other people, souls who are just like you trying to get healthy, stay healthy, or, you know, uh, reclaim their health. That's awesome. So where can my viewers go? Where can I go to sign up? Because I know you said the deadline um, will be December 1st. Yeah, so go to drbobbyprice.com. That's on drbobbyprice.com. Um, and just click on, you'll see it, It'll, it's the group detox. Uh, so you sign up there, you can either go as an individual or you can sign up as a pair. And uh, again, the deadline is December 1st because I just don't, I wanna be able to send out detoxes um, by the first week of de uh, December so that everybody gets their detox in time. I don't know what the mailing system is gonna be like, that sort of thing. So that's why the deadline is almost a month before we even get started. Yeah, it makes sense. So my last question for you is, we're still in a pandemic right now. What advice for people at home can you give to try to protect themselves? Um, any supplements or herbs should they be taking um, to try to boost their immune system? And if they have comorbidities, is there anything else that they should be doing to protect themselves? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the unfortunate thing about the pandemic has been that the only advice we've gotten is to shelter in place, wash our hands and wear a mask. And although that is, you know, uh, good advice is not great advice because that does nothing if you actually get COVID. So if you actually get COVID, then a mask, washing your hands, sheltering in place will do absolutely nothing for you. But the great thing that we know about viruses like the one that we're going through with this pandemic is that our immune system is very used to fighting though. Um, you know, we've gone through four other types of coronaviruses uh, that we've had uh, a breakout and we survived it without a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Mars, uh, MERS and SARS are two of them. Um, so MERS, SARS happened, I believe in 2003 and MERS in 2012. Again, these were breakouts that happened around the world. We didn't lock down, we didn't shelter in place, we didn't wear masks, any of that kind of thing. And so the reason why we were able to get through that is because we built immunity within ourselves. So a lot of people are hearing about things like building antibodies once you actually get the virus. Well, that's what our, our bodies always do. Like when I was little, my grandmother would tell me to go in the room with my cousin who had the measles or chicken yep. pox. So I can go ahead and get them and be immune to them. So our bodies, this is what we've been doing since the beginning of human existence. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to understand that we have an immune system that does work well to do that. Now, the complication with that is that a lot of people are unhealthy and have immune systems that are compromised. And in those populations, the elderly, people who are on immune suppressing drugs like people who are autoimmune conditions, people who are taking steroids. Um, these are the type of people who are unfortunately in that category of people who need to be concerned about it. But what we all also discovered is that almost 90% of people who had either severe or fatal symptoms when it came to corona, they had a, a chronic illness. Yeah. So it tells us that if you're healthy and you get corona, in most cases, you don't have any symptoms at all. You're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. 
But if you have a chronic illness, then it increases your uh, risk for going into either severe or fatal state. So the biggest thing you can do in this time is build your immune system up. Okay. And the number one way we could do that is by eating healthy. And that's because 80% of our immune system is actually manufactured inside of our gut by our good bacteria. Okay. And most people don't, you know, know that the good bacteria in your gut is what we commonly refer to as probiotics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's cool to take a probiotic, but it's best to get your probiotics from your food. Okay. When you eat food that comes from the ground, there's bacteria and things like that, good bacteria in the soil that are on the food. So when you eat it, it goes in your gut and lives there. It helps you create more immunity. Okay. And when you eat fiber, which is only found in plants, it feeds that good bacteria as well. When you don't eat plants, you don't feed the good bacteria. Okay. So that's why it's so important to eat well and to build that good bacteria in your gut so you can build that 80% of that immunity that is being created to not only fight off infections, but your immunity is also what fights cancer as well. People who get cancer have a compromised immune system, okay? So it's really important to understand. I wish we had been given this, and this is why when the pandemic first started, I came out with the video, I was telling people, what you need to focus on is your immune system. Because it takes, for some people, six to 10 months to rebuild that good bacteria in their gut and rebuild their immune system, okay? But you got to think about the vast majority of food, like meat, has hormones in it, antibiotics in it. Even if you get it grass-fed, like the, the cows are typically grass-fed when they're like calves, like really young, and then they sit off to our livestocking where they're grass-fed, they're not grass-fed, they're fed like soy and things of that nature for the rest of their life. So even when they say it's grass-fed, it's not in really. many cases, what, what has happened is they were grass-fed for like a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to understand, Why? like, they're not going to put that type of label on there. They yeah. And it's not required either. Same thing with dairy. Uh, those that if those cows are and I'm just using cows as an example mm -hmm. if they're fed things like corn and soy which they shouldn't be fed because cows don't eat corn and soy yeah. but if they're fed that they're going to be sick cows okay so you're eating a sick cow okay and that's going to create sick dairy because dairy comes from cows so it's really important to understand like you have to watch the whole food chain with your food and a lot of the things that they're doing today is they're tricking people with labels, like saying things like all natural, things like that are labels that, are, that aren't actually being regulated, okay? Uh, Grass-fed, yeah, they were grass-fed for a year and then now they're taken to a whole nother farm where they're now fattened up with corn and soy. So it's really important to understand that you really have to make a, sh a dramatic shift in your diet to change your health, which is what happened with, with you and your husband. Mm -hmm. You made a dramatic shift in your diet and within a space of about three months, right or wrong, mm -hmm. yep. you had a dramatic shift in your health. Yep. And so you can't do this, I'm gonna stick my toe over here and stick my toe over here if you want to get a dramatic shift in your diet. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest things that I'll name. In terms of like some things that I recommend, Make sure you get in some uh, elderberries, really good for boosting your immune system, zinc and selenium. But these are all things, the things that you'll find like zinc and selenium, magnesium, uh, these are things that you're gonna find in fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds when you consume them on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can take the supplements, but a supplement is just that. It is a supplement to the foundation. Mm -hmm. And the foundation is fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I'm going to make sure I get all my nutrients and vitamins from my food. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out to chat with me. If you guys out there listening, you want to follow Bob, Dr. Bobby Price on Instagram. It's at the Holistic Doctor, is it? It's Dr. Holistic, D-O-C-T-O-R, Holistic uh, on Instagram. On Facebook and YouTube, you can just um, search for Dr. Bobby Price. 
And again, I'm Fallon. You guys can follow me at Fit with Fallon on social media or fitwithfallon.com. And um, I'll have to have you on again because I, I wrote so many questions. I didn't answer, <laughs> I didn't ask you all of them, but I appreciate it. And you guys make sure to tune in next time, same place, same channel. Um, I hope you have a good one and I hope you guys learned some things. We'll see you later.